Welcome everyone to today's RMIT Online on the couch session. I'm Helen Sunis. I'm the CEO at RMIT Online and it's my great honor to uh, be facilitating the discussion this morning um, with three absolute gurus um, from industry partners that we work with to build our courses at RMIT Online. We have John from Deloitte, Julie from ISABAR and Professor Tim Shaw from the Digital Health CRC. I will introduce them more in a moment, um, but first we are on a very committed uh, journey of reconciliation at RMIT and as individuals uh, in my team at RMIT Online. And as we go uh, through that journey and, and understand the truths of our history in Australia, um, we would like to first acknowledge before we start today, the Woi Wurrung and Boon Wurrung, uh, the people of the Woi Wurrung and Boon Wurrung language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nations, uh, on whose unceded lands we conduct the business of the university here in Melbourne, Australia. I respectfully acknowledge their ancestors, past, present, and the all important future for our country and reconciliation in Australia. I would also like to acknowledge, as I know many of you come from across the country, uh, and we deliver our learning experiences online across Australia, the traditional custodians and their ancestors of all the lands and waters across Australia, where we conduct our business and, and teach our students. So really warm welcome. Um, a little bit more about the panelists because it's fantastic background on our topic today, which is the importance of technology skills in a, in a recovery period post pandemic. We don't feel quite post pandemic yet, uh, but we are speaking about post pandemic recovery at this point and um, real experts on the panel today. Can I start with John Omani, who is a partner at Deloitte Access Economics uh, and has extensive peer, uh, experience um, working both with the University of Sydney, uh, with us at RMIT, um, with government and across the corporate sector, looking at skills gaps and uh, contributing enormously to um, the economic and, and understanding of the skills economy in Australia. So welcome, John. So great to have you here today. Julie Kirkhoff comes from ISABAR Agency. For anyone not familiar with this wonderful uh, digital strategy agency, um, they work with uh, corporations right across Australia and beyond uh, to really help them on their digital transformation journey. So Julie is working as a, as a design thinker and strategist at the very cusp of helping Australia with their digital transformation and recovery um, from COVID. So really warm welcome to you today, Julie. Great to have you back. Thanks, Helen. Glad to be here. Um, and Professor Tim Shaw, um, who comes from the Digital Health CRC, not sure everyone's familiar with that language, it's a collaborative, collaborative research centre which brings together universities across Australia, including the University of Sydney where you are a professor, Tim, and uh, RMIT and many others to really advance and works with industry as well to really advance our understanding and capabilities in digital health, which is of course a, a massive sector that is working on its digital transformation and had a, a rather large acceleration of it, I suspect last year, Tim, in a pandemic period. So welcome, Tim. Awesome. So, so some of you are in Melbourne. Uh, we're coming in. The warm up question has got to be how was your snap lockdown, John and Julie? <laughs> and, um, and how are you doing? Are you in the office tomorrow? Uh, John, you're still on mute, I think. John, you're muted. Yeah. Can you believe we still do it? Yeah, no, it's a pleasure to be with everybody uh, today. Um, without the madness of homeschooling today, it makes it a little bit easier uh, to be working from here. Um, there's lots of soft skills, actually, Helen, that people have picked up over the course of the pandemic. Um, you know, better at certain communication, time management, and other general business skills, which is very interesting. It's just a pity that people haven't used all of that extra time at home to be picking up some of the technical skills which will address some of the, uh, the, uh, the skills gaps, uh, which we'll be talking about uh, today. Lots of time at home, but, but not enough time learning. 
Thanks, John. Uh, a great point and, and very much on the topic. Um, Julie, are you are you back in the office yet at all or? Or well, uh, coincidentally, we, we were about to move offices um, and so we took the opportunity of, of, you know, the changing work environments and everyone having now a fully equipped workstation at home to redesign what this new office will be. Uh, and so it's going to be about, you know, in, in person collaboration, bigger workspaces to do bigger workshops, client workshops, creative work, that sort of stuff. Um, you know, a place to develop a sense of community and belonging, which I think is one of the harder things to do online. But then also focusing on learning and development, because, you know, it's really hard to, for example, shadow a senior if you're working from home. But when we're together in the office, we can, you know, partner juniors and seniors to run workshops together, for example. Um, so what we're, what we're doing now is dedicated team days where the whole team is in the office on the same day, a specific day of each week. So that's what we're planning to do. Yep. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's an opportunity to reimagine the office, isn't it? I, I read one article that called it "Office as Culture Club." Now it's um, going to change what we need them to be. Um, very interesting. Thanks, Julie. And Tim, you're safe in Sydney. You, you're out of the naughty corner in Sydney, aren't you? Uh, yes. Yeah, so look, I mean, obviously, New South Wales has, doesn't doesn't go into lockdown quite as quickly as Victoria does. So, um, but I mean, obviously, you know, very very um, conscious of what's happening to our friends in Victoria. But um, you know, just kind of reiterate some of the same comments about the the new normal of the work environment. And and I guess for universities, it's obviously. You know, it's challenging. I was when we're talking about new skill development. I was just my my 18 year old son starting at Sydney University doing a BSc next year, and, and I was somewhat saddened to see his timetable, which was at least two thirds online. And I'm thinking, you know, how do you really, you know, how do you really learn those skills and and, and get that camaraderie? And, and so I think, I think universities, you know, obviously they're desperate to get kids back but it's had other other ways of doing it like judy was just talking about really you know we've got to create those collaborative spaces and others that allow allow people to have that experience and learn um yeah so very conscious of what's happening yes no it's a fascinating time the uni is thinking a lot mm. about that it's it's mm -hmm. about coming together socially more than anything else actually yeah, um, we absolutely. know we can teach online um awesome well welcome everyone and let's get into it John, futurists have been talking about the skill gaps and the future of work <laughs> uh, for many years now. We know that 87% from your own research, 87% of jobs in Australia require digital literacy skills, and we simply aren't getting enough graduates in the ICT area. You recently partnered with us <laughs> in some research um, about what has changed and what is the skills picture post-COVID. Tell, mm. tell us a bit more about it. Well, what I'd say, uh, Helen, is that even leading into this crisis um, of the pandemic, Australia already had a significant digital skills gap and emerging problem. Um, you know, if you will look at even the old forecasts, which Deloitte Access Economics had prior to COVID, um, the need for IT workers was, was already very high. So, yes, a lot more jobs in the next decade to come in the healthcare sector, you know, a lot in general business and, you know, contracting and procurement and management and those things, more fitness instructors, more um, IT workers, um, information technology workers uh, in Australia. We already had three quarters of a million of them, I, uh, information technology workers. I'm sure many of our, of our attendees today um, will be IT workers themselves or managing IT workers. Um, and, and our forecast put it at 150,000 more that we would need over the next over the next five years. And of course, universities doing their best, graduating around 5,000 information technology workers a year, but obviously five times five doesn't get you anywhere near 150,000, especially when you've got people who are leaving the workforce as well because they're retiring, et cetera. COVID has made that skills gap um, more acute. And that's because there are big changes in business and government in our digital story. Um, we've got some research coming out shortly about digital government, how many more people turn into government um, because of, you know, they want to hear about job seeker, job keeper, business investment allowance, super withdrawals, all that. So, so government has been asking for more digital workers. Banks have been asking for more digital workers. Businesses in e-commerce asking for more digital workers. So uh, even though there's been an overall recession in the economy, the demand for digital workers has been very high. Our new research with RMIT online, it's called Ready, Set, Upskill, hopefully catchy enough title to encourage people to download it 
uh, this afternoon. It points out to the specific digital gaps. Um, and while yes, there is uh, demand for uh, technology design services, the sort of services that, that ISO bar does that Julie, I'm sure we'll talk about uh, more later this afternoon, uh, more general programming jobs that are very commonplace in, in IT, cybersecurity cloud, we'll go through more of this, I'm sure in the next half an hour, but I mean, all the key areas that people would expect. But the one that really I must underline before, uh, but before um, passing on the conch is data analytics skills. This is the big change that's happening right now in Australia. As more businesses are getting into the cloud, they're seeing the benefits of using data analytics and those skills are really in, are, are really in very strong demand, Helen. Mm, amazing. Yeah, I sometimes refer to data as the fuel that drives the digital experience. It's, it's just so fundamental in every industry, isn't it? Um, uh, given the importance of the IT skills, um, you know, and, and your research and digital skills has only reinforced this lately, John. Why do we think we haven't accelerated more? And I'm, I open this to any of you in the uptake on those skills. What is the reluctance? What's the barrier, do you think? Well, there are lots of barriers in general to why people aren't keen to, aren't keen to, um, to upskill. I'll just give a couple of items from the research, but I'm sure that Julie and, and Tim will have uh, thoughts there as well. But there can be time commitments for individuals, you know, obviously they're busy with work, they're busy with family life, you know, do I really, you know, have the time to be able to take on these skills. I think there can also be a bit of apprehension that I work in administration or I'm a secretary. Um, uh, you know, I've got a general sales job, you know, is this really relevant for, to me and one of the one of the one of the messages from ready set up skill is that it is absolutely the, the, the case that people in general business jobs can segue into digital work, into digital jobs. They might become a programmer, but someone, you know, just as an example, someone who might be a secretary at the moment, they might take a, a short course just to understand a new finance program that's come on board in a large business. Yes. This is a real example in my head, someone who is a, a, a secretary um, uh, just a few uh, corrals away from me, learn about the new finance system, and then she became basically in charge of, for our, of our area with data analytics and, uh, and financial reporting. So those sort of segues um, in the workforce are, are absolutely um, possible. There's a bigger question about why we don't have more Australians who are 13 years of age, 14 years of age, 16 years of age, uh, 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 Tim's uh, children going through HSC, um, why not more of them are uh, thinking about technical careers and going in and wanting to study digital and, uh, and, and, and IT. I think that's incumbent upon, um, you know, the five of us on the call today, our attendees as well, to, to basically spread the message that digital is a very exciting uh, and, um, and profitable or rewarding career to, to, to take as well. Yeah. Uh, to Julie, maybe future. I'll just, can I make a comment, yes, Helen, on, on that piece? So, um, look, I mean, I, I think one of the challenges, I mean, I'm referring to health here rather than digital. I mean, we all know the huge potential, but, but, but the challenge with health, I mean, I, I often argue that I don't think health is a digital business. It's high tech. It is not digital. Uh, and I, I argue um, that we can do amazing things in, 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 with technology and healthcare. And if we were the space race, we would have we would have landed on Mars by now and have a colony. We, we drag the rocket to the to the launch pad with a horse and cart if we were in that kind of domain. We have, so I, I think we don't run as a digital business yet, uh, which means I mean we haven't had that transformation. We're going through it, but we're not. We haven't transformed like finance, travel, other industries. It's just not how you do business. You walk into any hospital in, in Australia, and sure, there's tech there. But it's not driving business. You know, if you're an RPA, you still can't access patient data easily from a hospital five kilometres away. You know, there's this fundamental piece is the analytics piece. Most of the analytics in, in hospitals at the moment are reporting out, not reporting in. We haven't done that transformation. So how do we actually really drive, use analytics to drive the way we deliver healthcare? And that's what's coming. So I, I think it's really difficult sometimes for people to see those paths to the jobs. So I actually I was flying back from the States last year with a mother whose son had just graduated with an IT job. And she was saying, so where should he go? You know, in finance, you can see all these jobs lining up and health are saying you know i'd go into health but they're not quite there yet particularly in the analytics space so i think you know this is one of the problems is this transition point where in health there's so much potential um, yes. but until we really transform that business we, we we're not going to get those jobs in in the yeah. kind of numbers that people keep saying are coming and, and 
And Tim, th this is such an important point because it, it it's, I mean, the pandemic effect, you had no elective surgery for at least six months in Victoria. You've had massive impacts driving more telehealth and so on. I mean, we were building courses with you through last year and we had yeah. to go from here's how to do telehealth to how to improve your telehealth because everyone was suddenly doing it. Yeah. You've had some acceleration, but but why is it not accelerating faster? Well, well look, I mean, there's so many, so many reasons for that. And, and, and look, I mean, and, and really when you look at it, the moment that you know there was nothing high tech in what happened in the last nine months in australia i mean vast majority was people picking up a phone you know and we've had we've had telehealth for 30 years 40 years in australia using telephony so so we haven't made that step that's happened internationally to really using data to support new models of care. Fundamentally, we haven't made that. And, and, and it's the heart of, of, of the analytics that surround in, in consumers to understand when their risk is rising, you know, how you then outreach them, how we put digital technologies around them, how that changes the whole therapeutic relationship. We just, we haven't done that. And that's the transition we've got to make. And can we leverage off what's happened into that? Yeah. Tell me for all of you, but happy to hear from you in health, Tim. A question from Cade Brown. What is the role of businesses, and I guess that's employers, maybe government as well, in reskilling their existing workforces to uh, <coughs> excuse me, address these skill gaps? Um, look, look, and, and I'll sort of let Julie speak as well, but, but, but you know, I mean, I think... Um, uh, it's funny because so I've been in education for a long time, right? And it's always been the hard sell. It's always been the thing that nobody's been really interested in. It's always the thing in the budget that gets knocked off. But even before COVID, there was a real realization that this was crucial. There was a realization in government that there's a whole workforce that doesn't understand how to operate in a digital environment, doesn't understand basic analytics, really doesn't understand how to integrate technology into new models of care. So I would say, though, that, you know, so there is real interest out there. Um, so I think we've got to use the next 12 to 18 months to really drive that. So government is already looking at this, you know, all jurisdictions are saying, how can we upskill? But then down to the individual organization, you know, what's the role? How do they, how do they actually assist in that so I think at all levels and then as a university I think we've been really flat-footed the university sector in really getting this out you know we still don't blend I don't think our, our health and our IT faculties enough you know to really drive out graduates that, that, that are that are really competent in both domains or take the kind of people that John was saying and reskill them to make them fit into into a, into a revised healthcare sector so yeah I'll stop there. Awesome. Julie, what constraints do you see in your many clients attempting their digital transformations? Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's a very big question because for, for digital transformation to be successful, there's, there's quite a lot of things that need to be thought about and fall into place. Um, you know, some things are dependent on the leadership as a start. There needs to be that urgency to change, to innovate, to transform, and, and a good understanding of why change is required. Um, you know, there needs to be a vision, a future state of what we want to achieve. There needs to be a willingness to invest time, money, resources, etc. So that really needs to be in place because if it doesn't, it all falls apart. It all falls apart, um, falls apart straight from the start. Um, then for the solution itself to succeed, whatever it is that we're doing, if that's a front front end system, a back end system, improving the customer experience whatever that is that we want to create or improve, we need to make sure that holistically that is a sustainable solution, which means that it needs to be desirable, right? Our customers need to want it. Mm -hmm. It needs to be feasible, meaning that we can build and maintain it and it needs to be viable. It needs to one way or another generate a profit. And then to make all of that happen, we of course first need to design and build that sustainable solution and for, sustainable solution. And for that, we need the right team with the right skills. And so here we want to look at things like making sure that we have a multidisciplinary team that also considers all the parts of the final product or service across the end-to-end -end journey. Um, we want to look at our ways of working, uh, for example, practicing an agile mindset to manage ambiguity, but also making sure that there is a willingness to collaborate and work together um, across silos in the business. For example, projects like that shouldn't be just IT-led or business-led. It shouldn't be one or the other. It should be a collaboration between the two. Um, yeah. That's not a point where it often falls apart. And then good project management. You know, we want to be able to run projects at pace, but remain flexible and adaptable. But then, you know, like everything I've just said is probably really obvious. But even if you have all these elements in place, it can still fail because what is missing is the human overlay to this. And that maps perfectly with 
the subject of this discussion mm -hmm. is or people or their skills and um, capabilities, but also people's ability to change. You know, first of all, it mm -hmm. depends on the visual maturity of the business. How ready are we for change? How big of a leap is the change going to be from where we are now versus where we want to go? And then on an individual level, um, you know, what's the comfort level uh, and the human ability of change? Because change is hard and people don't want to feel like change is being done to them. They need to feel that they're part of the change. Um, and, you know, if we don't allow the space and time for that, we can run into all sorts of issues, uh, you know, resistance to change, resistance to learning a new technology, not enough time for proper training, um, you know, social implications. If we suddenly collaborate differently and work differently, we might communicate differently. That might create uh, new social imbalances in the team, causing work stress, making people feel they, you know, no longer work in a psychologically safe environment. It's it's a whole kind of worms really. And yeah. it's a very complex often, change. Yeah, yeah. It's, we've seen it over and over again that a key blocker for digital transformation and, and the success of adopting a new technology or tool or solution is the people and people mm -hmm. are our most valuable asset right and we need to take care of them so do you what, see um, yeah. everyone doing a great job of that incredibly complex <laughs> transition uh, do you have shining examples in um Australia or overseas uh, uh, I'd say a, a few key points are number one, we want to involve the employees in designing the solution, whatever it is, and we don't want to limit the project team to the people who are already on board. Instead, we want to invite the disbelievers, the challengers, you know, we want to create change advocates, but we don't want to just pick right. the skilled people. Instead, we also want to choose the ones we know who might struggle and focus on them too. Um, and then another key point, what we what I've seen is that it's a huge differentiator and, and kind of makes or break or breaks the whole program is setting up a decent change management program and allowing time and budget to bring people on the journey to educate them to retrain them on how to navigate these new solutions and very often when the budget is tight change management kind of gets skipped but it's so important to get it right and to also kick it off at the start of the project not as an afterthought at the end um, what we want right. is, is, is kind of a lean change which is basically change management, but mixed with experimentation. So we want to focus on people's reaction to the change rather than managing the change for them. So lean management, lean change management is basically feedback driven instead of plan driven. It's, it's about delivering change in very small batches and really bringing those people along the journey. Fantastic, thank you. Tim, there's been a couple of follow-up questions for you uh, in the, uh the audience around case studies, either from overseas or here in particular. Oh, you're on mute, Tim. Um, um, well, you think after you think after 12 months of basic skill set would be, I know, it's, would be it's that so unmute before you speak. You're but, really anyway. clever. <laughs> <laughs> Um, sorry, no, I've been following that. So, so sorry, you, you wanted maybe a couple of case studies. So, um, yeah, Especially there was one question around the data insights being used to create new models of care, but also of earlier one about overseas, who's doing yeah, so, it well. So look, I, I guess maybe I'll do, do a couple of examples. So, so I, mean, I think, um, for instance, in the CRC, we, we're working with an American company called HMS, and um, they have access to all the um, Medicaid data sets in the US. So Medicaid um, covers off on, it's about, I think it's about 70 million Americans. I mean, some of the irony, America is, is, a, is a social kind of health system if you look at the Medicaid and Medicare population. So, um, so they have access to that data, which is richer than a lot of our data sets. It's claims data, but it covers off a lot of things. It's diagnosis, referrals and it combines acute primary um, care data, mental health and so on. Um, and so they realized a number, of, a number of years ago what an amazing data asset they had. Um, and so they started to, and I think traditionally when you look at data analytics, people often look at it, so they de-identify and then they, um, they use it for planning and policy in a de-identified sense. But I think the future of analytics is looking at how you can take this data and influence, look at a population level data set, but then influence individuals within that data set in terms of their own trajectory. So HMS is starting to work with its clients now to, um, to look at rising risk. And they're, so they're really starting to look at patients and understand they have a lovely diagram of a pyramid and with three layers. There's a red layer at the top, which is people that are already heavily engaged in the system 
quite unwell. And that tends to be where we focus, rather than the layer down, which is people that are maybe six to two years away from a poor health outcome, and actually working out how do people move through that dynamic so you can then intervene and stop them. And then there's a green belt at the bottom, which are people that are basically well, but are, are, are always at risk of, of moving up. So, so they're now starting to do major campaigns out to um, to that to that Medicaid population to 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 start to nudge people towards better health based on their own data. Um, so they send about 1.5 million messages a day out to that population. Um, a, a lot of it is around health messaging if they haven't done certain things, but they're becoming increasingly sophisticated about that. Um, and they also do things like if there's a cyclone emerging or a hurricane, then they can actually they can automatically fill the prescriptions for people that have high risk medications uh, that are in in the front of the um, um, hurricane coming through and things like that. So much more sophisticated. Um, we now working with HMS um, and, and there's also other projects in New South Wales called the Collaborative Commissioning that are looking at, at redesigning how we look after somebody um, with a with a cardi we say like I actually have atrial fibrillation myself. So it's just been a coincidence that I'm involved in cardiovascular projects, but really saying how does technology say wrap around me as an individual? So how does it monitor my health and wellness so can we start to bring in personal fitness data all that stuff how do you monitor that and and then um how do you outreach to me um how, and and who should i outreach to at the moment i see a very expensive cardiologist once a year and have a very expensive echocardiogram and wear a halter monitor that captures 24 hours of my heartbeat pretty useless in terms of overall monitoring of me and then I could die between appointments and nobody would really care um, so I, I think it's the new models of care how do you take that how do you reconstruct the, the technology that surrounds somebody like me do you provide those real-time analytics and then how do we change the model I, I probably need a virtual navigator I've got friends in the US who are virtual navigators that monitor people's health and reach out to them this is a whole new workforce we just don't have at the moment they don't need to be doctors they don't even need to be nurses. Um, so, so, so that that that's that's the way. And uh, and so at Westmead Hospital at the moment, we're doing we're doing a program where we're looking at um, interactive voice response systems of automatic call out to every patient that's discharged with AM, just to wrap a bit of technology around them to know do they know how to get to their GP? What issues do they have? At the moment, we just discharge people and never see them again. Um, I have more interaction with my hairdresser between appointments than I do my cardiologist. Um, so, so that. I hope that kind of describes the new model. Um, obviously, some of the challenges around that, are we don't, we still have fee-for-service funding. Our doctors get paid to do more. You know, we don't have capitated funding models that actually support genuine preventative health and new ways of approaching it. This again is this challenge we have not been digital. Um, so, you know, they're, they're real issues and the data linkage is appalling. The governance around that is in, impossible. Um, so we have real barriers to how we can bring even basic data around me to use for my healthcare, yeah. that's irony. Mm -hmm. An old measurement system for a for a new <laughs> a new yeah. model of care. I hope that describes. So that it's, it's yeah, how we really we have to take it and reconstruct it at all levels, and it's not about technology. That's the key thing. It's yeah. about outcomes and patients and how technology supports that. Yeah. Yeah. To your point too, Julie. Um, John, just to flick back to the macro where you've been studying this sort of impact on the economy of these skills shortages and and I guess also we're really talking about both the skills shortages and the barriers to change, um, both Julie and Tim have highlighted so well. Um, what is the impact on the economy if we don't address these issues? Mm. Well, I mean, it'll be a big impact on individuals. It'll be a big impact on businesses. It'll be a big impact on the overall economy. If we uh, if we don't get it right, um, you know we've done uh, uh, analysis previously of people who were segueing from you know standard professional roles into professional roles that have those extra digital capabilities. Um, it's about an extra ten thousand dollars a year extra in, in annual salary on average for people who are in kind of similar roles, but one which have that one which have that extra digital um, component. Um, so obviously, if you don't get the skills, you're not going to get the benefits. $10,000 mightn't sound like a huge amount of money, but if you think that's kind of on average as a starting point, obviously you get it every year. So there's certainly a dividend from, from upskilling, um, and that's consistent with other research about the benefits to, to education and training. Mm -hmm. um, for technology businesses, um, obviously, you know, they'll miss out um, if these, if these uh, technology skills 
um, aren't around. I'm not sure if Julie would count Isobar as a kind of a technology business or a, or a you know, professional services business, but um, obviously those businesses um, miss out if we don't have the tech skills. Um, I think our estimate is that our technology, media and telecommunication sector will grow by about $10 billion um, you know, over the next five years. That's at risk if we don't have these digital skills. And then there's more broadly other businesses, businesses like Deloitte, businesses in education, businesses in healthcare that, um, that won't grow as, as successfully without digital skills. We've done modeling before to try to understand overall the benefits of, of digital technology. And we put a, at around 6% of GDP since the year 2000. So if you think of the internet and all of the technologies that build off that, we think that it's contributed over, over $100 billion to our economy each year and, and growing thanks to, thanks to digital uh, uh, technology. So that's very significant. So for the audience, $100 billion compared with about $2,000 billion for the size of the overall economy. So more than 5% of it is thanks to digital. Now, obviously, those benefits won't, won't accrue without um, the digital skills. I'd also just say briefly that... Um, in certain environments, we don't really measure the benefits in terms of dollars and cents, particularly in healthcare and education, um, you know, save lives, improve outcomes, um, that won't be represented in GDP. We'll, we'd miss out on all of that without digital skills as well. I mean, this pandemic, we've obviously handled it pretty well as a country. The next challenge which we face as a country in five years or 10 years time, we will handle it better. If our, if our digital systems are better. So the dividends you know, are very broad and that's why lots of people are interested in it. It's why RMIT Online exists. It's why you know, my job exists. It's why uh, Tim's job exists. Um, it's why so many of our committed attendees are here today to learn more about and to drive this agenda. So it's not as though like oh, people aren't digitizing when all of this is happening uh, in front of us. It's the great event of our lifetimes. Um, but we're going to have to do it a bit better and a bit smarter in the next five years if we're really going to capitalise on it. Yeah. Julie, we, we saw in our recent study that there's a lot of anxiety actually around people not having the skills. You know, we go from the macro, there's clearly an impact on the economy, to the individual, and we see it with some of the questions from, from our audience, anxiety around their own skills. Um, about a quarter of people in our recent survey don't feel they have the skills to do their job and um, are worried about redundancy. Um, the enemy sometimes is seen as artificial intelligence and, you know, technology is always going to take my job. Where do you sit on that spectrum? You're working all the time in this space. Augment or, uh, or automate? <laughs> yeah, probably. The, answer, the correct answer is that that depends on the type of job, right? So we are, we are an industry 4.0, as, as they say it so nicely, and it's all about automation and data exchange. And that's especially true in manufacturing technologies um, and industries, but it also applies to service companies. Um, I think when we hear automation, automation, it's, it's very easy to just think about automating physical processes, you know, the 3Ds, dirty, dangerous and dull tasks, jobs no one want or even should be doing. Uh, it's kind of a no brainer to fully automate them you know, fixing sewers pipes or diffusing a bomb, et cetera. And even for the dull jobs, that's high repetition jobs requiring very little to no human thought, you know, assembly lines, fulfillment centers. These are all very easy examples, I think, of automation because they're physical processes. But as said, it also applies in the service industry, I think is where most of us work, where we create and offer not physical products, but digital products and services like, you know, health insurance or financial services products or a software subscription. Um, and there is no assembly line to automate, right? But there are lots of processes. Um, and what needs to happen is we need to really evaluate the value and complexity of each task and restructure our efforts so that our employees work on high value and complex work, which is what we call knowledge work, while we can automate the low complexity work. Because really what is automation, right? It's replacing human decision and actions by technology. And that is what we want and can do with that low complexity work. But for the high value complex, complex work, augmentation actually proposes that we use technology to support and improve our own human decision making and action taking. And that is done, as you mentioned, by artificial intelligence, data or application analytics, machine learning, et cetera. And there's already so much 
automation and augmentation everywhere. It's not really a either or, it's often very often a combination of things, you know, think automated claims approval or automated credit decisionings for lending products, marketing automation, right? They're all examples. It yes. can also sit on a, on a much smaller scale, you know, the, in the making of digital products and services, we want to automate pieces of code and box them together. So it makes it easier and faster for developers to work. Would you call this automation or is it actually augmentation? Because in all these examples, they're only parts of the end-to-end -end process that are being automated, right? Because automation, all it does is it frees up human capital for that knowledge work, the high value complex tasks. And these are the jobs that require an element of, you know, variety, you need for critical thinking, creativity, basically the human ingenuity. And mm -hmm. machines can magnify our thinking and apply it to data much faster and much more accurately than, than we will ever be able to do, but they still don't think for us. They can give us a recommendation, but it's up to us to apply intuition and ethics and empathy as appropriate. And, and that is really what augmentation is. So I guess the main message is that, that there always will be plenty of jobs to do, even if we automate you know, both the physical dirty, dangerous and dull jobs, but also the software automation in the service industry, because um, it will be up to us to make sure that we choose augmentation rather than full automation by adding explicit layers of augmentation of automated processes through asset applying that lens of ethics, intuition, empathy, et cetera, mm -hmm. to make sure that we maintain control basically. Yeah. Can I just say, can I just add to that, Helen? Mentioned. Yeah, Tim, please. Yeah, yeah look, I, I'm really glad you mentioned empathy there, Judy, because I mean, I, I think there's a real difference in healthcare to other industries, perhaps. It, it is that empathetic piece. And I, I also want some, I wanted to come back and, and congratulate my healthcare team. I actually really love my doctors and they are very committed to me. It's just they have no model to actually interface with me between visits. So I just kept comment on that. Because I mean, I think that really what we have to, I always say that, you know, technology won't replace healthcare professionals, but it will replace healthcare professionals that can't use technology i mean i think that's undoubtedly you will not be able to you know you can't graduate anymore just not and have somebody do your technology on the side it has to be front and center of your business but you know what we have to redesign is as we do that great redesign you talked about judy that we we have to understand how you build empathy and and, and that and that and that and that um, relationship that we all have with our health professionals is so important in health and then how do you support that with technology so you know the images of robots replacing um, humans for that is, is is certainly not on the horizon at the moment until you have really empathetic robots that can can do that kind of high high tech. So I just wanted to add that in because I think you know for universities it's really important that we keep that and and then you think about what are the new roles that maybe have data acquisition but also have interface with patients. Like mm -hmm. uh, I met Nancy, a, a, a woman in Boston um, last year who, who manages about 100 patients. She's a science graduate. She had three months training to be a virtual navigator and she's in full conversations. She's actually having this empathetic relationship, bringing people up to speed on their cardiovascular disease management. Whole job layer that didn't exist. Yeah, yeah. just one of, the, one of the point I wanted to mention there is that just as a caveat, I think in a business context, if we think about um, helping machines to make better business decisions, you know, maybe in that context, there's a little bit less empathy at play, but, you know, as artificial intelligence improves, there could be a, a case or an urge to shift from human made decisions through augmentation to human free decisions, right? Because the machine will always make the most financially favorable decision or pick the project with the highest ROI, right? The machine will probably get it right. But I think it's up to us to define the rules and conditions around that as mentioned based on or ethics or philosophical and human skill reasoning. So as mentioned, there is always that layer of control. And I think that is the role of leadership. Well, that, that is how it will be. Fantastic, thanks, Julie. Um, back to the macro, John, with so many um, benefits to flow from, from this upskilling. Have you seen any examples where countries have done a better job than Australia at this point in getting these digital skills more widespread in their workforce um, that you can share with us? Sure, uh, I think um, one example which we've pointed to previously is in the United Kingdom where their uh, digital workforce um, their IT skills are much higher than in Australia. Um, it would, it would, um, it'd probably shock the audience a little bit to, to, to give you the figures. For us, for us to, for us to meet the digital skills gap, um, to, to grow our workforce 
to the size of, of the UK's in, in relative terms. Over the next five years, we wouldn't need an extra 150,000 uh, IT workers. It would need to be more than double that. So it would need to be more than double that on our current trajectory of university graduates. It would take us 50 years in order to catch up with where the United Kingdom is, just because the, the, the incremental progress is, um, is, uh, is very slow. Um, with fewer international students coming to Australia and migration at a minimum because of uh, border closures, Australia's digital, um, Australia's digital skill needs, uh, yeah, they're gonna become very acute over the next couple of years. We're sort of surviving at the moment, but I don't think we realize just how, because it has been a recession, it hasn't grown by quite as much, but I think there's gonna be alarm bells ringing, you know, within the next 12 months as people are saying, holy yeah. moly, where are all these, where are all these digital skills? I haven't seen any different, you know, you know, vastly different models overseas that necessarily, you know, point the way for us. Like it is just that there are more people in overseas who do more kind of technical um, uh, subjects when they're at high school and then they go into these degrees when they're at university, they kind of are in a better starting point. Um, I think for Australia, we are simply going to need to have more people transition from current jobs into other jobs that involve digital skills. We're gonna need more people picking up short courses. I know that in the budget, which the federal government released in October of last year, they put in, the, in an extra $250 million to get, I think an extra 50,000 Australians through short courses um, uh, in key areas. Now that included digital, which is great, but it also included healthcare, agriculture, teaching, um, and a lot of that, like a few other areas too. So that will, I mean, that will help a little bit, but I think we need to do a lot more of that to shift people from current roles into, into digital roles if we're not going to have quite so many. Well, that hopefully more will come through universities, but um, they're just not going to arrive in the workforce quick enough. Um, so I think transitioning people from current roles, short, short courses is going to play a very important role um, in, uh, in doing that. The other long-term agenda is addressing diversity in Australia's digital workforce. The level of, of female participation, uh, the composition in our digital workforce is terrible and it's worse than other professional um, uh, occupations uh, in Australia. Um, and from previous research, I know that that really dates back to what people are doing at uni, what people are doing in schools, um, existing gender stereotypes that's obviously discouraging young women from going into to tech roles. Now, I'm not saying that's going to be something that's going to be fixed overnight, but it'd be remiss of us not to... Well, I, mean, I shouldn't say start now. I mean, people have been trying to fix that for years as well, but I just say that needs a little bit more attention as well. Gender diversity in the longer term, but um, and, and more more students through university, but I think short courses in, in the... Short courses in the short term is what's going to be most successful. Short term. Ready, set, right. upskill also finds that different courses have different levels of, of success. We find that some students feel, some employees feel as though very long courses don't always produce the most relevant um, skills they need for right now. Um, and that short courses can be really effective, particularly if people use their skills straight away. So that's the other recommendation in the, the Ready, Set, Upskill RMIT online paper. Fantastic few minutes left can I go rapid fire a one liner from each of you there's a lot of people also wanting advice from you as a such an experienced panel what's your one piece of advice for our audience Tim well look I, I think you know if you're thinking about a career in IT and health do it I mean there's very what I, there's very few professions you can have where you go home thinking I made a real difference to humanity <laughs> you know and I think that's what drives the healthcare and health profession so we need people in health with soft and hard skills and technology so if you're thinking about it leap in there will be work and jobs great ad <laughs> awesome um julie um one tip of one piece of advice i'd say that you know in the in literally in the history of humankind it has never been easier to learn new skills right the access of modular modular digital courses both paying and free it's immense right you can do a course at an online uni like RMIT online or you can just search on google and youtube and you'll find there is a how to video and content about almost everything anything digital so i'd say if you have the willingness 
the willingness to learn you can build skills in in whatever specialization you want and it's amazing how much you actually can learn in just a few hours uh, over a few weeks so start start today <laughs> it's a message thank you and john to end oh alongside the technical skills i'd encourage the audience where have you get the opportunity to develop your soft skills um, as well is there an opportunity to be part of a professional association um, networking uh, opportunities, an opportunity for, you know, for public speaking, for collaborative problem solving, you know, those sorts of things, um, you know, can really strengthen your career over time as well. So I think any kind of ex any extra extracurricular or network things that you can be involved in to broaden your learning and to make you, you know, a well-rounded professional, um, you know, is obviously um, really valuable as well. Fantastic. Fantastic advice and, and some wonderful case studies and insights today. Really want to thank you all, Julie, Tim, John, uh, for bringing your wisdom uh, to this group today. Um, we have recorded it. So if you know anyone who would have liked to catch it but couldn't today, we will be posting it in the usual socials um, where you can also follow us and learn more about our working with actually all of these wonderful um, organizations <laughs> represented today, our partners in our short course portfolio portfolio and our grad, graduate certificate portfolios in the digital skills um, largely focused. So um, really uh, do follow us and um, thank you all so much for staying um, right to the end and um, to our panelists for a fantastic contribution. Much appreciated. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye.